Well, good morning, everyone. What a joy it is to be here at my alma mater. Everything is so different here. This is just such a great uh, joy and honor to be here. Christian, thank you so much wherever you went. Christian, it is, uh, those are very, very sweet, encouraging, kind words. They're not all true. Uh, Madden, yes, I've lost consistently to you, but that isn't the way it's going to stay. I will beat you this Sunday. Um, Christian is one of the handful of students uh, that, go, that go here that also go to our church. Um, we do have uh, a tradition at our church that every Lord's Day we open up our home. My wife is so hospitable. We just want to live life together in the community of believers that God has given to us. We planted a church nine years ago in Northridge. And the goal when we planted the church was to make sure that we would live life together intentionally in community with one another and make sure that we point each other to Christ, not just in the worship service on Sunday mornings, but throughout the week. And so the goal is always to live together, always to be together, always to point one another to how amazing Jesus is, and then to go and make disciples who make disciples. And so my guess is that by this time in the semester, you've probably already found a solid home church family that you are plugging into, that you're serving, and that you're being served in. Uh, but if for some reason you are not involved in a local church, you are not plugged in, I just want to warmly welcome you to Christ Bible Church in Northridge. Uh, you'll meet a lot of the uh, same students that you get to hang out with. You'll get to hang out with them on Sunday mornings. And then if you do come to our church, just make sure that you block out the whole Sunday because you're coming over to our house. We're going to hang out. We have so much fun. We, we eat together. We talk theology together. We play Madden together. We watch football together. We go out. We play basketball at the park, share the gospel with people, invite those strangers that we just met to come on back to our house to eat dinner with us, to talk about the Bible, to talk about Jesus, to talk about the gospel. And so we would love to have you be a part of our church church family, and to enjoy Christ with us together. Hey, uh, Johnny, thank you so much for the invitation to come speak here at TMU. It was not you when I went here. It was still C. I don't know what that means. I feel like my experience was maybe less prestigious than yours because I went to a college, you went to a university, you're going to university. Uh, it was master's college when I was here. Also, the orientation of this room was completely different. Chapel, we walked in and we faced this way. Now we're this way. Uh, there, there's a lot that seems to have changed. I heard a rumor that Waldock is a man's dorm. Is this true? <laughs> That's really strange to me because it was a woman's dorm when, when I went here. So that's a little weird. Also, I found out that my major doesn't exist at this school anymore. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that, like, when I got to the end, they said, hey, Patrick, great job. We're killing this program because it, you just, it was so awful with you. We're done. It's over. So it doesn't exist anymore. I, again, I don't know what that means. But uh, hey, there's a lot of things that have changed. There are some things that never change. There are some things that never change. For instance, one of the things that never changes, I, I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard Hotchkiss won the Masters Cup. Is this correct? Thank you. I see you. I had the uh, predestined, elected grace of God, foreordained knowledge of God to be able to room and dorm in Hotchkiss my entire time here. And so, well done, everyone. Continue. Yes. Now, most of you don't like me, but some of you really, really love me now, so this is good. <laughs> Some things never change. The worship through song. I had the privilege of serving in the chapel band when I was here. And to hear your voices raised to the Lord this morning. What a joy. When we started singing in Christ alone, I just started welling up with tears. To, to, to hear and to see an army of believers who love Christ. What a joy to hear you sing and to worship the Lord through song together. And of course, some things never change. The reality of the Bible being the central focus and authority of everything that happens here at TMU, that has not changed, that will never change, and I praise the Lord for that. And because of that, I have the privilege of opening the Word of God with you this morning with hungry hearts, hearts that love the Word of God because you love the God of the Word. So, please take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 
10. This is a very familiar section of Scripture, and our familiar, familiarity with this parable can cause us to think that we know the story better than we really do. For instance, if I were to ask you what is the parable of the Good Samaritan about, common answers would be, well, it's about helping those in need. It's about uh, coming alongside someone and helping them if they have a struggle, if they have a problem. And it isn't any less than that, but it is definitely far more than that. Yes, we should show kindness to strangers, but Jesus is telling this parable for deeper reasons. And the real point of this parable becomes clear when we pay attention to the immediate context. So Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, we will read all the way down to verse 37 and then ask God's blessing on our time together. And behold, a scholar of the law stood up and was putting Jesus to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, the lawyer said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers and they stripped him and they beat him and they went away leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down on that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him, and he bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Father, we we gather in your name and we gather for the purpose of being transformed. We do not want to be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders who while seeing they did not see, while hearing they did not hear, they did not perceive We want to see exactly what it is that you would have us see this morning. We want to know, we want to perceive, and we want to be transformed, and that is only possible through your Holy Spirit doing the work of illuminating our understanding. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, open our eyes that we behold wonderful things from your law. We need you. We need your help. We need your divine assistance, or else all that we do here this morning will prove to be profitless. So we come before you, Father, and we say with Samuel, speak, O Lord, your servants are listening. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. This portion of Scripture really is easily outlined. There's three main sections, and so we'll break it up this morning into the three main sections. We've got the setup, we've got the story, and we've got the so what. The setup, let's look at the setup. Number one, verse 25, the background, the setup, the context. A scholar of the law stands up. That is, some of your translations might say a lawyer, uh, not lawyer in the sense of criminal law. This is lawyer in the sense of expert in the Torah, a professional theologian. And he's a scholar in the law, but he's standing up to ask Jesus a question that has inside of it insincerity. He's trying to put Jesus to the test. He's basically trying to say, look crowds at how professional I am in my wisdom and my knowledge and how amateur and naive Jesus is in his knowledge. And so he asks, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He asks 
an amazing question, perhaps the most important question that could ever be asked. J.C. Ryle says about this question, it deserves the principal attention of every man, woman, and child on earth. We are all sinners, dying sinners, and sinners going to be judged after death. How shall our sins be pardoned? How shall we come before God? Where shall we flee from the wrath to come? What must we do to be saved? These are inquiries which people of every rank ought to put themselves, put to themselves, and never rest, never rest until they find an answer. So this is a very good question, perhaps the most important question, but there's something wrong with the question because this man's motive for asking the question is insincere. He's wanting to test Jesus. You see, eternal life really doesn't matter to this man. He wants a debate. He's not coming desperate to the Lord saying, help me, save me. He wants to debate. He wants an ap- academic wrestle. He wants a battle of wits, as it were. Not only is it an insincere question, it's a question that has an incorrect presupposition. What must I do? As in, I've done a lot, I can keep the law, I'm a good enough person, and so therefore there are things that I can do. And specifically in this text, because of the way that he's describing that word do, the the way that that word is used here in this text, he's saying, I've done a lot, I just need one more thing. Just tell me one thing, I'm missing one thing, tell me one thing I need to do. This is very similar to the question that the rich young ruler asked in Matthew 19. What must I do? to inherit eternal life. I think I'm a good person. I can do something good to gain salvation. So Jesus says, what's written in the law? You're the expert in the Torah. You're the expert in the law. You tell me. And the man answers, quoting Deuteronomy 9 and Leviticus 19, or Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. He's answering, using Scripture to tell the the correct response to, to his own question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, yes, you've answered correctly. You know the answer. Which, by the way, I think it'd be helpful to pause right here and make the observation that just simply knowing the truth is not enough. This man knows the truth. He does not live according to it. He's not transformed by it. He's not affected by it. He knows the truth, but he is unaffected. There's a danger, specifically at a school like this, where the truth is ever present in front of your eyes in every single class. Praise the Lord. But there's a danger to think that knowing truth equals transformation. Clearly it doesn't, because this man's an expert in the law, but there is no transformation that's taken place. Jesus says, you've answered correctly. And then he says this, do this and you will live. Literally, in Greek, it's keep on doing this. Do this continually. Never stop doing this. The lawyer had asked, give me one thing I need to do. Just tell me one thing. I'll do that one thing, and then I can be saved. And Jesus says, no, there's something that you need to continually be doing. Keep on doing it. Jesus isn't even saying if this is possible but rather that this is necessary. If you want to do something to get to heaven, if you want to work your way to heaven, here's how you do it. You have to perfectly keep the law. You have to perfectly keep loving God and loving neighbor without ever failing in one second of those two categories. If you want to get to heaven, here's how you do it. If you want to do it on your own, here's how you do it. You have to be perfect. Keep the law perfectly. And If there's anyone who should have known that's impossible, it's an expert in the law. It's somebody who looks at the law and says, the law levels me and makes me see how awful I am and how impossible it is for me to be saved on my own goodness because I have none. That's what the law's job is. It's our tutor to lead us to salvation. But this man has a hard heart. His answer should have been when Jesus says, yes, go do this. Keep on doing this presently, progressively, continually. Keep on doing this. The man should have responded and said, but I can't. But instead, he says, and who is my neighbor? Notice he skips the love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength part. He goes, I've got that one. I just need to know who my neighbor is. Brothers and sisters, 
There is, probably in our lives, if we look back on our lives, not 10 minutes collectively where we have had our mind, soul, strength, uh, every affection that we have completely oriented to the Lord and loving Him the way that we ought to. And yet this man says, I've got that down. Just tell me who my neighbor is. He wants to justify himself. Verse 29, wishing to justify himself. He wants to make himself look good. He wants to vindicate himself. He wants his goodness to be on display. This is what every legalist wants. They want to look good in the eyes of others. And so he crafts a question designed to make himself look good. He's telling Jesus, in essence, you make this matter seem simple. Just love your neighbor. But it's more complex than that, Jesus. I I don't know if you knew this, Jesus, but it's very complex. Who is my neighbor? The reason why this was a complex issue for the lawyer is because back then there was a constant rabbinical tradition of arguing about who is the neighbor that we need to love and the enemy that we're allowed to hate. Jesus even said this in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember, you've heard it said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. And so Jesus is being asked the question, define for me who my neighbor is. But here, we also see this man's heart on display. This is the wrong question to ask. Do you notice what he's asking? Qualify for me who I need to love so that I only do the bare minimum and do not love people who I am not required by God to love. He's asking the Lord to carve up categories of people. Who do I need to love and who do I not need to love? It's like when I was growing up, my mom would say, Patrick, can you please clean your room? I'd say, sure, mom. Uh, What do you want done? Right? Can you define, what what do you want done? Tell me what you want. Do you want my clothes picked up? What do you want? Because I want to make sure that if all my mom wants with me cleaning my room is to pick up my clothes and put them in the laundry basket and make my bed, I don't want to be vacuuming. I don't want to be dusting. I don't want to do any more than I'm required by my mom to do. That's what this man is asking. It's a wrong question. It's proving a stingy heart that doesn't want to go over and above in loving others, but wants to know precisely who he's required to love so that he doesn't expend any extra energy in loving people that he doesn't need to. That's obvious. Jesus could have easily responded, well, your neighbor is everyone. End of story, we're done. But he says, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. So we've got the the setup. We've got the context. We've got a a test of a question given to Jesus. And now we've got Jesus responding to who is my neighbor. Let's look at number two, the story. You know this story. It's familiar to you. Verse 30, Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now we can't know for sure, but probably this is a Jewish man. He's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's going down down in elevation, this is a uh, 3,500-foot drop from Jerusalem to Jericho over a 17-mile road. Um, if you have the privilege of going to Ibex, anybody here gone to Ibex? Yes? My, my, uh, another huge privilege I had when I was here at Masters was going to Ibex. And you've heard it so many times, I'm sure, but it's, it's not if you go to Ibex, it's when you go to Ibex. When you go to Ibex, you will travel this road. You will go down this road. You will see how terrifying this road is. There's a portion of this road called the Ascent of Adumin, the Pass of Blood. There was so much bloodshed that would happen because people would hide. There were robbers there that would hide in caves or hide behind boulders and come out and destroy whatever they wanted to take whatever they wanted. And so Jesus says, this man is traveling down that road. And he fell among robbers. And they stripped him and they beat him. That's in the tense of continually kept on beating him and went away leaving him half dead. He will die if no one helps. And it just so happens that we're going to meet three people that see this man. First, a priest. A priest happened to be going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. This is a priest. This is a servant of God, one who offers sacrifices for the people in the temple. He is supposed to represent the best of men who know the law, who live out the law, and serve God's people. He surely would have known Exodus 23, verses 4 through 5, which say, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it. So if you see your enemy, uh, your enemy's animals wandering away, even though it's your enemy, take their animals and bring them back. 
Again, he knows the law, but he's unaffected by it. He knows what he should be doing, but he's unaffected by it. So instead of helping this man, he passes by. That's a verb that's found nowhere else in the Bible except for this story in verse 31 and verse 32. It's as far opposite as you can get, and it's an active verb, running away as fast as you can to the other side. Why would he do this? Well, the Pharisees considered themselves to be unclean if their shadow even touched a corpse. So this man's probably thinking, I don't want to be unclean. He probably served in Jerusalem already since he's descending from Jerusalem to Jericho. But he says, I don't want to be unclean. I don't want to touch this man who perhaps is already dead. Think of all the excuses that this priest might have given. I want to be clean. If he's dead, I can't be clean. I can't touch this man. It's interesting how so many quote-unquote religious people use biblical texts to get themselves out of doing what they should be doing. That's what this man does. And he leaves. Secondly, we meet a Levite. Priests, the first guy, are Levites who are descendants of Aaron. Levite is a descendant of Levi who is not a descendant of Aaron. It's one of those uh, concentric circles, those Venn diagram things. A Levite, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. And so here is a Levite, verse 32. He sees the man and he passes by. Again, same word used in verse 31. They're both missing the point in James chapter 1, verse 27, that pure and undefiled religion is taking care of those around you. They've completely missed that. And so, they walk to the other side and leave this man for dead. But, verse 33, a Samaritan. A Samaritan. There is no more unlikely man to stop and help a Jewish man than a Samaritan. And you know why. You know the Jews hated the Samaritans because they were these half-breed traitors. The Samaritans were the descendants of the Israelites who had intermarried with the pagans after the Assyrians had captured them and took them into exile in 722 BC. And then during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, when the Jews were able to come back, the Jews asked, will you help us? Or the Samaritans were asking the Jews, rather, I want to help you. And the Jews said, no, you're Samaritans, you're half-breed traitors, and so stay away. This was the whole Sanballat thing. So they decided, we're going to destroy the rebuilding of the temple and the walls. We're going to destroy Jerusalem. There was animosity between these two people groups. The Samaritans were so hated by the Jews that in 128 BC, the Jews actually went into Samaria to destroy their temple. And they're considered worse than the pagans in the Jews' eyes because they had completely polluted their religion. In fact, if you wanted to say something bad about somebody, just call them a Samaritan. This is what the Pharisees did with Jesus. Act, or John chapter 8, verse 48, the Pharisees say to Jesus, you are a Samaritan and you have a demon. That's uh, the worst curse that you can level onto somebody. So we would expect the Samaritan to see this Jew lying in a pool of blood, laugh, step over him and say, you're getting what you deserve. But instead, the Samaritan who himself is on a journey comes up to him sees him. Now, we've seen the exact same thing with the Levite and the priest. They saw him, they come up to him, they see him. But here's where there's a difference. This Samaritan feels compassion. He feels compassion. The Levite and the priest had seen but had no compassion. The priest and the Levite knew what to do but didn't do it. The Samaritan probably had much less knowledge than the priest and the Levites, but he had compassion. And so what does he do? You know the story. He bears the injured man's burden as if it were his own. And whatever's going to help this man comes solely from the Samaritan because this man had been beaten, robbed, and left for dead. Everything that he had had been taken away. So the Samaritan comes to him, bandages up his wounds, pours oil that's a balm to soothe and to soften the tissue, pours wine on, on the wounds and antiseptic to sanitize the wounds. The Samaritan was on a journey. He'd brought these supplies probably for cooking or for first aid. These are all of his own provisions. He's not stingy. He's giving of everything that he has. Just, just picture the blood that's on his fingers. Picture all the dirt that's on his hands, that's on his knees as he's helping this man. Jesus could have stopped the story here, and this man would be a hero. But Jesus doubles down on the heroic behavior of this man. 
He, bring, he puts him on his own animal, middle of verse 34. This would have been the animal that the Samaritan was riding on. And so therefore, he gives up his ride. He says, you ride on this. I will walk the rest of the way. Takes him to an inn. Takes care of him in the inn. Could have just left him there. Said, hey, this man needs help. Please help him. I'm out. He obviously has somewhere he needs to be, but he lays aside his plans. He takes care of this man. He takes care of him so much so that he stays the night. He brought him to an inn. He took care of him. And then on the next day, verse 35, on the next day, so he stays there. Probably staying by his bedside, probably watching him as he's struggling to breathe, making sure that every movement of his chest isn't the last one that he's going to see. He cares for this man. He stops all of his plans to love this man. On the next day, he gives the innkeeper two denarii. Denarii was a day's wage. And the typical hotel fee would be one thirty-second of a denarius. And so therefore, two denarii equals two months room and board. And he gives it to the innkeeper. And then he says this, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. This is a formula for extortion. He's opening himself up to be used by this innkeeper. The innkeeper could have said, you know what? The man really needed a, a brand new 4K television. He said it would help him heal up. And so it had to be a part of the expense. So you need to pay me for that expense. He could have opened this up to any form of extortion. He just cares for the needs of this man. He gives of his own clothes, his own supply, his own time, his own good night's sleep, and a huge lump sum of money. No self-preservation, no self-containment uh, of his resources. He doesn't want to hold on to anything. He willingly gives it all. And then Jesus says this. At the end of the story, Jesus says, verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? This is probably the easiest question that Jesus ever asked any human being, right? Right? This is the most obvious answer. And the man answers, the one who showed mercy to him. But did you catch what Jesus just did? I wonder if you see what Jesus just did with this question. Remember, what was the lawyer's question? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus does not ever answer that question. Instead of saying, here is who your neighbor is, he switches the question and asks, who was neighborly? Who was kind? He didn't answer the original question at all. He doesn't ask, was the wounded man a neighbor that the Samaritan had to love? No, he doesn't ask that. He says, which one of these three proved to be a neighbor. The lawyer's question was, who is my neighbor? Jesus' answer is, are you even neighborly? The lawyer's question, tell me who I have to love. And Jesus, in essence, is saying, if I told you, would you even love them? Jesus switches the question and never comes back to the original question. Why does he do this? Again, most people would say that he tells the story about taking care of people who are in need, and that's definitely not, not what it is about. But the story is so much more than that. Jesus, in giving this story, is answering the lawyer's first question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer thought that he was good enough to do things to get to heaven. Through Jesus' question, Jesus is holding up the mirror of the law to this man, the mirror of God's righteous requirements to show this man he doesn't love like this. The parable is not, here's what you should do, but rather, here's what you don't do. The Good Samaritan doesn't preach to us our duty, but reveals that we've never even met that duty. And that leads to the so what. We've got the setup, this lawyer testing Jesus. We've got the story, and now we have the so what. The so what. We can say it in three main parts. Why is this story here? What's the so what? What's the application of the Good Samaritan. Number one, there's bad news in the Good Samaritan. There's very bad news in the Good Samaritan because on our own, left to our own love, our own ability to serve and to give and to love, this kind of loving is impossible. 
We like to think of ourselves when we read this passage as the Good Samaritan. I'm going to go around, help people, love people, take care of people. We like to think that we are the Good Samaritan. But we aren't. We can't be. When Jesus says, who proved to be the neighbor to this man? And the lawyer answers, the one who showed mercy. Jesus says, go and do that. And the man should have said exactly what he should have said at the beginning. I can't do that. I am unable to do that. I don't have love in my heart for others the way that I ought. And if you're here this morning and you read this parable and you think, you know what? I'm just going to try harder to love people. I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. I'm just going to love people. You're falling into the same trap that the lawyer fell into. To think that somehow you and I are able on our own to love the way that God requires us to love others. We can't do it. That's the bad news of the Good Samaritan. Instead, we should respond by saying, oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me? Who can transform this heart? And if the lawyer had asked that, or if you are asking that this morning, who can save my heart? I don't love the way that I should. Jesus would respond to you this morning, I can save your heart. I can transform your heart. See, we're not the Good Samaritan. Jesus is. Just think about it. Jesus loves us the way that the Good Samaritan loved this man. Think about the man. He's left for dead. Jesus did one better for us. We weren't left for dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We had no ability to do anything to get God to love us. Think about this man. He has nothing to offer the Good Samaritan. Any service, or any help has nothing to offer. Can't walk, doesn't walk can't take a step, all the work is done by the good Samaritan. The Samaritan sees him, loves him, has compassion on him, cleans up his wounds, pays every penny, takes him to an inn. Again, Jesus does one better. He doesn't just take us to an inn and say, uh, be warm and be filled. Jesus takes us to his table and says, here, be a part of my family as a son or a daughter of the Most High God. The Samaritan says, here's money, I need to leave, but when I come back, I'll make sure that you're taken care of. And here's money to help you in the meantime. Jesus doesn't give us money to help us in the meantime while he's left and he's going to come back and get us. He gave us the helper. He gave us God, very God, in the Holy Spirit to help us, to help us get to the end, to help us finish the race well. Just like the Good Samaritan, Jesus didn't wait for us to get our act together. He knew that we never could. That's why Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Every other religion in the world has man in the gutter, getting out of the gutter and getting themselves to heaven. Only Christianity has heaven coming down to the gutter to save lowly sinners like you and me. So we have the bad news of the Good Samaritan, but then we have the good news of the Good Samaritan. The good news of the Good Samaritan is that Jesus Christ has seen us and has felt compassion on us. Jesus could have been like the priest and the Levite. He could have seen us and said, you are helpless and hopeless in your sin. And he could have left. And he would have been just in doing that. He would have been fair and righteous in seeing us running our race to hell and not acting. But instead, what he does is feels compassion. For God so loved the world. And he gives his only son. This is the beautiful news of the Good Samaritan. Jesus is proving that any and every sinner is ripe for righteousness because the ground at the foot of the cross is level. We are all worthy of death and Jesus is our hope for life. Most people assume that there's two categories of people. There's good people, there's bad people. This is what most religions teach. There's good people, bad people, people that try hard and people that don't try at all. Jesus is redefining that in this parable. He's saying, actually, there's only one category and it's called bad and we're all in it. There's only one category of people. And so what Jesus says is, I'm going to make a second category, and it's called gospel, so that bad people can be declared righteous because of my working on their behalf and not because of their work at all. That's the beauty of the gospel, and that's the beauty of the good news of the Good Samaritan. 
So the bad news is that we are unable on our own. The good news is that Jesus Christ alone saves us, loves us. And finally, the last so what of the Good Samaritan is that now, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you follow Him, you love Him, you are a disciple of Jesus, and you have been given a new heart, now you can go live out this love because you've been given the love of God into your heart to give to others. See, the priest and the Levite, they knew what they should do. They just, they didn't have an information problem, they had a heart problem. You and I don't have an information problem, we have a a heart problem. We need our hearts transformed. We need the, the heart of stone to be taken out and a new heart of flesh to be given to us so that we can love others this way. Never perfectly, but to image the love of Christ to others. Again, if you walk out of here and you say, okay, I'm gonna be better, I'm gonna try harder, and you've missed the whole point. You and I are unable to live like that. The, the, the whole point of this parable is Jesus holding the mirror to the man and saying, see, you can't do this. So before we ever go and attempt to do what Jesus is saying, we must stop and stare at Christ and say, I, I can't do it. Jesus, I need you. The law that the lawyer lived under says, go and do this and you'll live. Go, do, you'll live. The gospel says go and do because you've already been given life. And so this man being given life, if the lawyer would have just received the transforming effect of the gospel, it would have changed everything. Are you here this morning having been affected by grace? If so, go and be gracious. Have you been affected by the love of God in your life and in your heart? Then go and be loving Go and live this out because now you can. The lawyer couldn't, but you can if you have a transformed heart. Can I just ask you this morning, is your default emotion, as you look out at others, is your default emotion one of compassion? That you look around and you see people and you feel compassion towards them. Martin Luther used to say when he was asked, what does it mean to love your neighbor? he would say it means being Christ to them. Obviously not in a salvific way, but you image the love of Christ to those around you. And when we're tempted to ask, who is my neighbor? What is the bare minimum? Just remember how Jesus gave up everything to love his enemies. The theme of chapel is apologia, how to defend your faith. And obviously there are the main apologetic questions, the historicity of Christianity, the reliability of the Bible, proof of the resurrection, all of those different questions. And you have amazing professors that will answer all of those questions for you. You have world-class scholars that get into this pulpit that can define those questions and answer them with the most helpful answers possible. So instead of me attempting to do that, As I thought through apology, I I, I thought through, you know what, what does it mean to live in such a way where our living defends what we believe? Jesus told his disciples in the upper room on Thursday of the Passion Week in John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also love one another. And then he says this, you know it. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. Why? Because they're going to look at the love that we have for our neighbor and they're going to say, that's not natural. That's not possible on your own. They're going to see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven because they're going to see the love of Christ displayed in us and through us to a watching world. So, TMU, can I just plead with you? Live on and live out the love of Christ to every single person around you without qualification, without category distinction. Everyone is your neighbor. We won't do this perfectly. We fail all the time. And that's why we love Jesus, who did this perfectly, never failing once, and then says to you and to me, here's my record of perfection. Take it. It's yours. 
and now live with a transformed heart that loves Christ, loves the world around you, and wants to bend out the love of Christ to every single soul you meet. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the reality of the Good Samaritan and how it levels us the way that it should have with the lawyer. And Father, I just pray for anyone in this room just standing in the, in the way of truth constantly over and over again from chapel to classes to church. They are given truth time and time again and maybe like the lawyer, they have been unaffected by it. They still have yet to be transformed. I pray even now that you would open their eyes to see the glory of the gospel, that they would see their own sinfulness for what it truly is, that they would see their helplessness and hopelessness apart from Christ, that no amount of effort or good work on their own will get them any right standing before you. And then may that drive them to the cross, drive them to forgiveness found by clinging to Jesus. And Father, for those that our believers here, for those that are your disciples that love you and have been called according to your purpose. Father, make us an army of men and women who will bend out your love, Christ-like love, to everyone around us. May we love with the love of Christ. May people leave after talking with us and meeting with us and hanging with us. May they walk away with a, an aura of heaven about them with a sense that they've interacted with a supernatural love. Not because we have anything to offer, but because Christ is our all in all and we offer him to everyone around us. So Father, be glorified as we exalt Jesus, as we love him who first loved us, and then we bend out that love to others. Help us to do that by the power of your spirit, according to your word, and for the glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And all God's people said, amen, amen.